the enemy because you told me don't focus on him and it looked like he just wanted to show up because you told him not to focus on him. So Lord, we're still not going to focus on him, but we're going to do that that you have sent us to do. Let your word fall on good ground. Break up the fallow ground. Anything in me that is unlike you, remove it, forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, make me whole. I never want to be an offense to you. I never want to disrupt your grace. I am only as good as you allow me to be for your kingdom. And when that time is over, so shall I be. I'm asking God that your people would be recipients of your word on this day, that healing and deliverance and all the promises that you have given us, that you say it belong to us. Let us embrace them, receive them, and let us manifest them through the words of our, our mouth, through the words of our testimony, and through our lifestyles. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. I love you. You may be seated. I thank God for being God. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it is still year 57, 84, 23 and 24. What's in it for you? It's the year of the dollar door. Oh, can you expect your more? What's in it for you? I made a commitment to do what the Lord told me to do, which is to explain the impact of the Hebrew year on the happenings around the world. And the more I delve into this, the more fascinating it becomes. I thank and praise God for salvation, sanctification for Jesus and for the Holy Ghost, for Apostle Bowers, all of our pastors and leaders, executive leaders, present and absent, online. I love you. I'm praying with you. Those that are grieved and bereaved, those that are dealing with illness in their home, those that are just dealing with strongholds like I was today. Those that are just contending with the cares of this world right. that choke out the word. Because it's not always that we're sinning. It's just that we're trying to keep up with the cares of the world. I wasn't sinning this morning. I promise you I was. But everything that came up, my PowerPoint disappeared. My notes disappeared. I went to three different computers. Apostle Bowers has been watching me work on the notes, work on the message, but it just is, you know, so now I just say, okay, God, what you put in me, yeah. let me give it to the Holy people. Say that. Because he did say that. He said, ain't nothing stopping. Ain't, not, so there ain't no stopping us now. Way before that was R&B, the Lord said that. So ain't no stopping us now. But the topic today, I've enjoyed everybody. I'm excited to see Minister Candace in the sanctuary. Yes. I have been yeah, feeling a weight regarding her since she has taken on this mammoth role of being a chief executive officer of a multi-facility yes. federally qualified healthcare center. And she is a CEO in a healthcare center where she received care in uh, her own time, where she testified at her opening of being, uh, and it was a grand opening, yeah. uh, of being a single mom. And the person she brought up that helped her to be where she is today was Brenda Dockery. Yeah. That overwhelmed me because of the closeness Brenda and I, Dr. Timberland Boyd, uh, kind of those of us who were newbies out in this, how do you take care of people of color stuff back in the 90s when we didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Now in 2023, we have somebody that not only knows how to do it, but the season has been smart enough to put her in position right. to do it. Yeah. And she is and elect clergy here at Vessels of Minor Church. Right, yeah. And her name is Minister Candace Lennox. And let me talk to you. She's so hot. And what I really have been loving of late is that Deacon Chuck has been showing up in a seat on behalf of the white. <laughs> When she hasn't been here, he has been here and he has requested prayer for her. He has interceded for her. 
And I tell you, if he's here and he's if he seemed like he looked like he smelled me coming, he'd be outside. <laughs> and uh, I, I want you to know I thank you for that. I thank you for that. I thank you. I love each of you, Elder and Minister Wheatley. You all are on post without us questioning. Minister Mayfield, I love seeing you get you back. Yes. I love yes. seeing you anoint when we come in with yes. oil, singing your song. Mother Pruitt, the Evangelist Goodwin, thank you for giving exhortations for leadership. Thank you all for being on the leadership hall yesterday. All of you who are on line. I cannot see Mother Glass. I see Mother Goldsberry. I see the Cooks family. Uh, I see I believe Sister Taylor. So others that I don't know of Pastor and Mother Lily and maybe a few that I don't know on there because I can't identify you by what you have up on the screen. But I want you to know that I love you and I appreciate you being here this morning. Because tomorrow morning isn't promised, but we're here this morning. Yeah. So let me tell you, you're going to have to, I, I will, we're going to get this together, but God has a word for you as it aligns. He has a word for us. In fact, he has a season for us. So my question to you today is, are you sifting in your shifting? Right. Are you sifting in your shifting? Because there's a shift going on. All right. Yes, glory. There's a shift going on. Yeah. And a shift is to exchange or replace by something else. You can shift something out. I'm going to shift out this old washing machine and get another one. You can replace something old with something new. That can be considered a shift. The shift is also an unpredictable change. A shift is when we think we're dealing with the flu and we're trending down with the flu, and then we get a shift that says it's COVID-19. Right. So COVID-19 was a shift. Mm -hmm. It didn't allow us to take the time to trend towards it. It just showed up, bam. Yes. It was a shift. All right. So when we shift, a shift is when there's no time for trending because a shift is needed. Church, we are in a global space on this earth where there's no time for trending. Yeah. We need to shift. All right. We need to shift because when God gave us a space of grace to trend, when we should have been shifted, we just rode the tide. And now he's saying, okay, I gave you enough time, but I showed you to shift then. Yeah. But instead of shifting, you decided, let's not just pull the Band-Aid off this wound. Let's just rub it down, you know? We, we, we have gotten used to rubbing down sin when sin has been shifting to make sure that it wins. So there's this other thing that happens. We shift, we turn. Sometimes when there's going to be a car accident, you don't have time to trend and calculate. You got to do a hard shift. You got to do a turn that's much harder than you may want to do. Shifts are usually things that we don't really want to do. If a couple breaks up, there are shifts that occur. And statistics would tell you that if there's going to be a divorce and if the casualty are going to be children, that it's better to shift out of it instead of trend it down. Yeah. Because the longer you stay in it trying to pretend it's going to work when you know that it's not, All right, then you're impacting generations yes. who are also going to trend and hang out with things longer than they should. We have to get comfortable, saints, in shifting because God is telling us to shift. He's saying you've been there long enough, now shift. 
You've been acting like this long enough. Now shift. You've been sitting in your comfort zone long enough. Now shift. Well, sometimes we don't know what he wants us to shift into. Right. But his concern is, are you sifting while you're shifting? Because a sift can emulate itself as a tree. But a sift isn't a trend. A sift is when you're putting sometimes blocks of stuff into this thing. I had a picture. Y'all know what a, a sifter look like when we put flour in there? Yeah. Why do we sift flour when flour is already fine? That, that's, that, that's one of those paradoxes in life. Why do we need to shift flour if flour is already fine? Because it has got some little clumps in it. Right. It, got, it got some little, those little bitty grains, they'll get together right. and they'll clog up. Some of you all have had a piece of cake where the flour didn't get shifted. And then in your piece, you see that little round piece of flour. And you know you be thinking, how come they didn't sift that flour? How come this little clump? And they charged me for this cake. They got a clump of flour in it. So sifting is to put a fine or a loose substance through something called a sieve. So you have to have these instruments. You have to have a sieve. So allow me to say that the sieve or the saints is the Holy Ghost. So you have to have the sieve of the Holy Ghost in order to put the substance inside of you that needs sifting so you can shift into where God wants you to be. If you hold on to the clumps that are in the flower and shift without sifting, then you're going to struggle in the new place that God is putting you. Because you're making a conscious decision to keep the clumps. We talk about them clumps, but let me tell you, when your hand feel like it ain't going to be able to keep doing this to that seal, right. then them clumps look like maybe, they, yeah, oh well, we might we might just leave some of them clumps. Be like me and you start getting cramped in your hand yeah. while you're doing this with that seal. Then you might say, you, then, then you know how we do sometimes, then we shake the seal. Right. When we can't push it, when we can't pull it anymore, then we just shake it to try to get the flower to come out. In the spiritual, I want you to recognize that the Holy Ghost, right now, we're in a shifting season. And much of the global body of Christ is not ready for the shifting because they haven't been engaged in the sifting. Okay. Okay. So we've kept the clubs, even though we had the sin to get rid of them. We just kept the clumps. But now the Lord said, hey, it's time to shift. It's unpredictable. Tonight, put that, put that blood over the doorpost. I'm coming. And if your house ain't ready, your first, firstborn going to die. Then you say, wait, wait a minute, Lord. I ain't done sifting. But I gave you time to sift. I gave you time to sift. And you decided that you could make a cake with clumps in it. You decided that the cares of this world were more important than you getting the clumps out of the flower of your life. And if I am the bread of life, which I am, saith the Lord, why would you use me? Why would you make up a batch of a loaf of Jesus and have clumps in the flower? Mm -hmm. Oh, the clumped and gummed up Jesus, but now that the shift came, we said, come on, Jesus, come on. And he said, I'm trying. I'm trying, but you didn't sift me. Mm -hmm. And now it's clumps in the way. Oh, and the clumps that are in the way are now hindering your divine shift. 
I need you to shift because I need you to pass it up and I need you to get ready to go because I need to test you somewhere. Okay. Because it's not about you, it's still about me. Yeah. Right. And the reason it's about me is because it's about my father. And my father is not a trendsetter. He's a shift maker. Yeah. Saints, we're trendsetters. But the father, he a shifter. <laughs> you right. know, we watch those movies, a shift shaker. You just stop being worried about these horror films. The, the shift shaker you need to be concerned about is the father. Yeah. <laughs> because when the father make that shift, and tell Jesus, who don't even know the day or the time, because he said the Father's reserving it to him. When the shift shaker says, go get my bread, All right. what does your bread of life look like? You ready for the shift? Or you got some clumps that you said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I didn't mean to live this way this long. Oh, won't you break up these little crumbles? I need you, Lord. Don't have no clumps because the Father's on his way. While we say, oh, oh Jesus. And then we look up at the church gone. Because the shift shaker said, go get my church. But we didn't sit in our shift. Saints, your life right now is in a shift mode. You know, I, I grew up driving stick shifts. Right. So I know the difference between first, second, third, fourth, fifth gear. You know, when you got real good, you could get them five gear cars. You didn't have to get them three gears. You knew how to drop it low. You got to pop that clutch when you was out of gas and roll down that hill and get to the gas station. I know I got some egg hands up in this room. We knew how to pop that clutch. We knew what to do to make that shit. But I tell you what, if somebody put sugar in your tank, it don't matter how you shift it. Somebody mess with your system. Okay. So sifting and shifting, let me just give you those because sifting typically happens in a large bowl. It's, it's put in something big and then it is caught in something smaller mm -hmm. because you are taking all of the clumps out. Mm -hmm. To sift, this, it, we separate finer parts from coarser parts. God is letting us know that it's time for us to separate the finer parts from the coarser parts. Okay. It's time for us to stop worrying about what we think somebody said to us, or even if everything you said is true, you still got to let it go. That's right. Because if you don't, there are coarse pieces in your sister. All right. Even if the person you're accusing is guilty, it matters not if you allow their coarse brain to prevent your sifting in your season of shifting. You got to release. And saints, let me tell you something in 2023 towards the end of it. The saints haven't released enough clumps. Mm -hmm. We still putting clumps in a sifter right. while we're shifting. Mm -hmm. When we put clumps in the sifter while we're shifting, then the only thing we can do is trend. Mm -hmm. We don't have the power to shift because we got too much coarse stuff. All right. So now when God is saying, I need you to jump up and run around the church seven times. Now we got to say, okay, Lord, well, I might be able to, if somebody get a wheelchair and push me, maybe I might be able to get around half. Nobody got time for that. Amen. He said, I have given you time to get rid of the spots, the blemishes, the wrinkles, the any such thing that's going to prevent me from using you at your highest and best use 
in your life that you don't realize as soon as they come, as soon as that bump comes, as soon as that wrinkle comes, as soon as that spot and blemish comes, you have your sieve and you sift it. Sift it and make it become subject to your sanctification. Right. Sifting should be subject to your sanctification. All right. Glory to God. That's a line that you should write down. Shifting mm -hmm. should be subject to your sanctification. I could say shifting is subject to your sanctification. Because if you have failed to sanctify yourself, then the very God of peace cannot sanctify you holy, and you got clumps in your sieve, and you think that you're living without spot, blemish, wrinkle, or any such thing, and the father is saying, son, go get my bride. And you don't want to be left behind. Anybody in here want to be left behind? Anybody on Zoom want to be left behind? So this, what, what in the world? So I told you that we're in the second year of Joseph and also in the Hebrew calendar year 5784, the focus that I want to do for you, I'm going to do a shift today. And then we're going to back and I'm going to shift to David from Joseph. Because there's an important thing that we need to catch up on in this shifting and our sifting. So we must recognize first and foremost that in this war, I got 22 pages of notes and not nary slides. So I'm scrolling up and down and I know it's in my mind. So I'm trying in my spirit. So I'm trying to make sure that I'm giving you some key points today. Just a highlighted points. You know that I'm good for, for getting the curriculum back to you. There are some key things in the way God is handling his people right now. Dur during this war torn time, right now, there are some key things that we have to look back historically, and if we take the time to do it, we can understand what's going on. Are you sifting in your shifting? Are you just shifting? And you like Santa Claus ain't got nothing but a bag full of coals. <laughs> because the coals ain't getting through the sieve, y'all. It ain't getting through the sieve. So oh stop putting stuff in the sieve that won't sift. All right. <laughs> You got to stop putting stuff in your sieve, in your spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let, let me make the sieve your spirit. You got to stop putting stuff in your sieve that can't be sifted. Because when you put coals in your spirit, when it comes time to shift, you will not be able to shift because you have something in your spirit that can't be broken up small enough to go through the sifter. Yeah. Okay. Stop grabbing a hold of folks, situations, and circumstances that you know cannot get through your sin. All right. If it can't get through your sin, just let it go. Walk up. If you know it can be fucked up on who got it, <laughs> yeah. they bringing you close. That's right. And you putting out your, your little four-ounce sieve, and they bring you a 16-ounce clump. And they're going to mad. They be mad at me if I don't take it. So I got to act like I can take this 16-pound clump. And then that, that big old 16-pound clump into your little four-ounce sieve. They happy go lucky because they threw you the clump. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now what you do? Yeah, yeah. You do a lot of me, you see all this stuff that I got terror hurts on my to keep me from having cramps in my hand. Mm -hmm. I fool around, I'd be somewhere trying to get your 16 pounds. Next thing I know, my hand's like this. I can't, I'm trying to do this to get my little four ounce. Mm -hmm. We cannot 
should not and are not called. Somebody ain't gonna like this, but it's true. We are not called to take on anybody else's 16 pound piece of coal. Oh, that's that's right. When we got a four ounce sieve. Yes. God ain't telling you to do that and you ain't got to take math to figure it out. All right, if somebody brings you something bigger yeah. than your sin, uh -huh. bigger than your Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. and they want you to carry their 16-pound piece of coal, and you know that your Holy Ghost is a four-ounce sin, yeah. stop collecting these 16 pounds of coal because you ain't ever going to sin them. And when the church comes, and it is here right now, the church is in a shift. But the saints ain't all ready to sit. All right. Hallelujah. So you're dealing with leaders trying to get people in line and get to the altar and at least come and get prayer where they came because they ain't sifting. And their weights are too heavy. And the weight, uh, the weight and the sin that has so easily beset us are preventing us from getting to our own sin. We know we ain't got enough Holy Ghost to handle it. And now we walk around up and down the street trying to find somebody with a Holy Ghost big enough to give them our clumps. I'm responsible for your clumps. All right. Ain't nowhere in hell with my name on it that said, oh yeah, you here because you need to carry so-and-so sin clumps. Okay. That's a lie. Right. Your name is not written in hell because hell was never made for people. People just decided that they wanted to act like the devil who ain't ever been human. And God told me, get the devil conversation because it's not the problem. It's these lots of trouble that can't get through the sin. Right. The Holy Ghost cannot allow the breaking up require in order to get down to the fine flower so that the bread of life can do his job. Right. 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 Thank you. So one of the Hebrew letters we're dealing with is the Tav. And the Tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And is the first and last letter. And I have pictures of this for you all. It's the first and last letter of the word Tavni. Tavni means pattern. Tavni means pattern. But in the Hebrew alphabet, Tavni, the pattern, because this is very important in today's message, Tavni, the letter Tav, is a cross in the Hebrew language. And the word tabernacle begins and ends with the Tav. Yes, so the Tavni, in Hebrew, I'm talking to those who say Jesus ain't from Genesis to Revelation. But I want you to know that when God spoke to Moses, he said create a top knee. And the top knee that you're going to create is going to have a cross at Alpha and it's going to have a cross at Omega. So before you even know anything about uh, Emmanuel, All right. I am putting a cross at the beginning and I'm putting a cross at the end, and you're going to make a tabernacle based on this cross-by-cross cross pattern because I'm going to give you the pattern to make my dwelling place. That's the next shift. All right. All right. So let me shift you into a dwelling place because I'm going to talk to you about the four doors because there are four biblical doors we need to focus on. But the first thing I need you to understand is that Oh, you ought to get excited. That Tavni, we wouldn't know it if we ain't studying Hebrew and ain't looking at it. But the word Tavni, and you read Hebrew from right to left, and on the right side of Tavni is a top, which is a cross. 
on the left side of Tav Neath is a Tav, which is a cross. And when you say Tav Neath together, it's called a pattern. So there is a pattern that God has put in place as a dwelling place for us that's covered by the blood on both sides before Jesus ever got here incarnate. Oh, you know, I told somebody this week, your church might be having Bible study, but do they let you study the Bible? What I'm doing is letting you study the Bible. I ain't just having a Bible study. And I want you to know that at Vessel of Honor, it's been a whole lot of Bible study. But what's different about us is that we let you study the Bible. We don't just tell you to come to Bible study, listen to what we say. Now, it might be five, it might be five thousand, it might be five million. But if the only thing I do is sit in a Bible study so that the one behind the podium can tell me what I need to know, that's only part of the equation. To be able to go to a Bible study that allows you to study So the top is a cross. What a mighty God we serve. That when Moses came down from the mountains, if you've heard it preached, I know it's been less than a few times, that what God gave him a pattern to do started and ended with Jesus. Okay. I don't know nothing about that unless we're studying the Bible. The root word for pattern, because this is important, shift, sift, keep with me, put them all together. The root word for pattern is bana, which means to be. So, another shift. We can't build a church according to our own path. That's right. That's true. And we got a whole bunch of paths. Yeah. We got a whole bunch of churches that got a whole lot of paths. And let me tell you, when you leave one church to go to another church, you got to figure out the path. That's right. And then you better pray that they give you the cloth so that you can use the cloth upon the pattern so that you can cut it out so that you can sew where whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is, where it is, who it is, but there is a pattern. But every pattern that a physical church has wherever they are on the planet cannot be built if it is not the pattern that God gave in the first place. Okay. So maybe you want to know the pattern. So we prioritize things. We prioritize the cares of this world. We prioritize these things above dwelling with me, saith the Lord. My, my. We have shifted without sifting, and now we're heavy because all we can do is stop by and visit. We can't dwell in the tabernacle. My Lord. We're place. too heavy to dwell in the house. Okay. Oh, God said, make me a tabernacle. But we're too heavy. To stay here. The pastor's claim. We, we can't just be dwelling in the house. I got to help my children with this new math that they got them doing. Tomorrow, Sunday morning, I ain't got time to dwell in your house, Lord. We got to go to do the laundry. That's how we in this early Sunday. I, I, I'm going to visit. I'm going to visit. And I promise to stay till 11. But if they go to 11, 15, I'm out. Because people have turned us as leaders, as executives, as lay members, we have been turned into visitors because our house has become foreign to ours. Wow. Because our house is not a home. Oh, if there's no one there. But if God is saying this, God is at home. Can't find no one there to hold me tight. And there ain't no one there who I can kiss. Good night. 
What did the Lord want to kiss you good night? You ain't at home. <laughs> My Lord. Hmm. Don't get mad at Luther. Luther just heard just was somewhere sifting one day. <laughs> he fooled around in his sifting. He fooled around and got something down in that Holy Ghost sieve and it came out. What's the difference between the house and the home? Yeah. Well, that's the same thing God was saying. Are you willing to build me a dwelling place or do you just want to visit me? Because if you just want to visit me, then I'm a foster parent. All right. And I adopted you. Mm. When nobody wanted you when you were an orphan, when you were left and undone. Mm -hmm. I adopted you. But if you want to, I'm not going to foster parent. Mm. My Lord. Then just go with you there. Mm. Just go with it. What I want you to do is dwell. Yeah. When's the last time you got comfortable dwelling in this house? For more than three hours. Mm. When's the last time you got comfortable hanging out at home with God in his sanctuary, designed by his pattern, three hours. When's the last time? So God is saying you prioritize, you have prioritized things above dwelling. So you want to visit and you want to stop by, but can I find a people who really wants to dwell with you? Because all these, all these prayers you got, the, the answer's in the house. All these issues you got, the answer's in the dwelling place. Well, for Moses, that was a tabernacle. But even then, the pattern of the tabernacle, unbeknownst to him, the blueprint had Jesus as the Alpha and Jesus as the Omega. Yes. So God provided a pattern to build a habitation. Somebody say habitation. habitation. Okay, do you know the difference between visiting and habitation? As many times as I was in the hospital, every time I was there, I had to remember I was a visitor right. because the enemy wanted me to believe that it was my habitation. And if I would have accepted it as my habitation, I would have never left. Yes. Because once I made it my home, then I had... That meant I accepted a key. And that meant that instead of me sifting, I shifted. But now I'm saying I'm just going to be here. <laughs> My Lord. But let me tell you what happened one day. Every time I went in, I came out. All right. right. Hallelujah. I took yeah. somebody with the Holy Ghost shout hallelujah. If you've been somewhere in life and you knew you shouldn't have been there, and every time you got there, you knew you shouldn't have been there, but Anybody ever been in those situations but then still got out? All right. Thank you. Because that means every time you got out, you said, I don't live with you, but I ain't living with you. My Lord. Depression, you are. Right, yeah. You got me in bed this one day, but let me tell you something. We ain't roommates. All right. And you in my house. So the shift is, I get to kick you out. I'm not here. Stop trending folks out of your house. They ain't supposed to have been there not one time, and now they're there three years. You can't even go in your own refrigerator because they got everything labeled with their name on it. You ain't got nothing in it now. How do you, why are they in your house? I know. I'm trying to you better become a happy teddy bear. My gosh, you can't do it. 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 You I don't know if I'm talking to nobody up in here today. But let me tell you, he said, but I need you to build a habitation that is acceptable for me to dwell with you on earth. Another important point. Because ain't nothing wrong with God's house. Nothing at all. 
Ain't nothing wrong up in heaven, y'all. Ain't nothing. All of his stuff is right where he wanted to be. Yeah. And I promise you ain't nobody coming in there moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ain't nobody changing no tablecloth in the holy of holy, not up in heaven. <laughs> ain't nobody moving no furniture around up in that tabernacle, not up in heaven. So God is saying, don't worry about my house in heaven because I got that covered. Mm -hmm. What I need you to do is I'm going to give you a pattern Hallelujah. of my house in heaven. And I'm going to allow you to take that pattern and build a habitation for me on earth so that where I am, you can be also. Oh, I just messed with somebody's theology so fast. Because that, we say, well, that's what it is when we go back to our mansion. Well, actually, if you stop going to Bible study and start studying the Bible, you will find that God is saying, I want to be right with you. So much and so, I'm going to give you a pattern of heaven. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you how to make me a habitation. Now, I ain't making no visitation. This ain't no wait. This ain't no walk through. I'm going to give you the pattern to build a habitation so that I can dwell with you. And so you can dwell with me. But we have gotten so foreign to our habitation that coming in here from eight to 10 is a chore. And Jesus said, I was just getting ready. I was just, I was getting ready to deliver you from that thing you asked me about when you woke up this morning. I, I, I heard you when you called on me last night. I was getting ready to do that, but I, oh, I thought you came to dwell here. You just came to visit. Well, I ain't got, if, we, if you just in for a quick visit, I ain't got time to get you to live. Because you know that stuff you caught up in, in the English, y'all call it deliverance. In the heavens, I call it bondage. And this is going to take something real spiritual to get you free. Yes. But if you just visit them, somebody hear what I'm saying. If you, I'm talking about this physical sanctuary. If this is God's habitation, if all we can do is come visit at 10055, God cannot do what he desires to do for us because we want him to shift without us sifting. So he makes it better. It's not, it's not even, it's not hard. It's the benign. Scrolling through, what would have been slide? So are we willing to debunk our blueprint and go back and rebuild by using God's pattern? That's a real question. Where you are right now, it, it, it's the simple stuff. We can say, you willing to come back and play the keyboards? Because that's God's pattern. You willing to come back and play the drums and do the, do the praise team? But are you willing to just come sit and consecrate? Amen. When it ain't no music, are you willing to open your mouth? Are you willing to just do it? Are you willing to just talk with me? Mm -hmm. I'm with you. And I'm still here. All right. Then we're in this, also this, it's called noon. It's the number of 50 in the Hebrew, and it means jubilee, servanthood, signs, miracles, and wonders. And we are in a season of breakthrough, sign, miracles, and wonders. And this particular year, I'm going to share with you, one of the doors is the door of the treasury. And if you really are worried about fiscal things, God got a door for that. Wow. And it ain't let's make a deal. So tell me what door it is. So we're in this, we're in this time of building. He gave us the blueprint. I want to get to where he actually, I want to give you a scripture for it. Exodus 25. And the Lord was talking to Moses in the beginning of Exodus 25. And he told Moses, go speak to the children. Tell them to bring me an offering. Make sure that they give it willingly from their heart. So even back then, God didn't want an offering that was mad. And... <laughs> God never said that I'll still pay my bills with it. 
You know, we say give us your mad money because we can still pay the bills. Uh, that ain't in God's path. God doesn't say that. Man. He says, don't bring me a bad offering. Yes. And then he outlines the offering everything he tells us to do. If you go down to 25 and verse 8, what's so important, Exodus 25 and 8, this is what God told Moses. He said, to go talk to the people and let them make me a sanctuary. Exodus 25 and 8. God said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary. And those first, those first seven verses, he give it, it was a good house too. All kind of stuff. You read those first seven verses, it, it wasn't no junk. You know, yeah. Blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat's hair, brass, silver, gold, all this you know, it's immaculate. But then in verse 8, he says, give them all the materials. Give them all the materials, church. You ain't got no deals on the, on the Holy Bible. Amen. You don't own the whole communion tray. Listen, let them make me a sanctuary. Out of all this beautiful stuff, because I ain't no jack leg guy, I'm going to give them the shifter, the sin that they need to sift because I'm calling them to a shift. And I ain't got time for them to figure out how to pop the clutch. Yeah. I need them to know what barrel and onyx and gold look like. I don't need them to get enamored and stop and look at the topaz. I need them to realize that these are the material that I want my dwelling place made out of. Because where I want them to come be with me, I want it to be the most beautiful thing ever. Whenever you come in here and spend three hours with God, it ought to feel like the most beautiful thing ever. Because in verse eight, he said, let him make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell among them. God wants to be where you are. My question is, do you want to be where God is? Because he wants you. I'm debunking that. He wants you to be where he is. And he told us what where he is should look like. In verse 9, he said, according to all that I show you, after the pattern, I'm going to continue to underscore that word, pattern of the tabernacle and pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. The tabernacle is going to be the way that I say it need to be. The instruments are going to be the way that I need it to be. And you will have it. I'm giving you the pattern of how it should be. Because when I walk in, it needs to look like where I just left. Because I am not trying to give my people something less than what I have when I without them. God is not just waiting for you to get to heaven to give you heavenly things. He wants you to dwell in the same love right now. That he has in heaven. Oh, oh, oh. I don't usually say, I know I got a friend in Jesus. Somebody come on with me. Now. So then they went on, they talked about it more and more. And it's excellent to read that entire 25th chapter of Exodus. Yes. The reason that's important is because all of this has to do with, thank you, all of this has to do with Jesus. Mm -hmm being at the beginning and the end of the Hebrew word tabernacle. Yeah. There's a cross at the beginning and the end, so you ain't going to miss Jesus if you do it. Some of y'all scared to do this. This is the Old Testament. ain't got nothing to do with us. You better go study because there was a cross on the front and on the back. Mm -hmm. So as we looked at these different years, I told you last year was the year of the remnant. Joseph had gotten his entire family 
fed during a time of uh, famine, and he uh, loved them no matter how they treated him. So he got through that year. He got the remnant. He had the blueprint. So Joseph did what he needed to do. Moses did what he needed to do. Now as we're in this year, 5784 started September 15, 2023 on the Hebrew calendar, taught about it and have some PowerPoint curriculum on it. But now I just want to shift real fast. And I did bring a big enough sieve to do this. I need to make a shift and I need you to shift with me. I need you to shift with me from Exodus to Matthew. Because Hebrew words read from right to left. So, so the cross started here. I told you that. But now I want to show you how it ended here. And I want to show you the importance of this pattern that we got to get into gear. This message does have an action step in it. So actually, let's go to Mark, 16th chapter. Hallelujah. Somebody give God glory. I know somebody saved and know what he is. Give him glory. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. And you have no idea that you two. Hallelujah. Well, I love it because that's how the Holy Ghost does. Mark 16, 13 through 28. Jesus came to the coast of Sisera Philippi. We know this. He asked his disciples, he said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Well, first of all, he gave you the answer in the question. Just saying. And they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one new prophet. He said, okay, but who do you say I am? And here comes something very important. And Apostle Bauer said this in prayer. I think it was in the leadership meeting where Andrew was really the first disciple. And Andrew was Peter's brother. Andrew is actually the one who saw the little boy with the two fish and the five loaves. He don't get credit for a whole lot. Right. The biggest thing that Andrew gets credit for is bringing his brother, Peter, to be a disciple. Peter wasn't the first disciple. His brother, Andrew, was. All right. But Jesus started talking to Simon Peter. And Peter said, you're the Christ, son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are thy Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto you that thou art Peter. Now I got to go back to Tabernith. Tabernith. Also meant it was, that's the pattern. The pattern that ended with the cross, the pattern that began with the cross. The importance of this is Jesus was bringing the tabneath, which they would have understood, into the conversation. So he said, you're Peter, and now upon this rock, another piece of building equipment, too big to sift, mm -hmm. but not too big to shift. All right. So you got to know the items in your artillery that are only for shifting and not for sifting. And you got to stop taking the gunpowder to build a wall because the gunpowder goes in the sifter. It's not a shift. Okay. The gun might be, but without the powder, it ain't nothing. My Lord. Glory to God. So Peter on this rock, because Peter needed the name means rock. So I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Because all the way back in Exodus, when I gave all y'all, I'm telling you, y'all have messed up every time I gave you a pattern. I gave you a pattern and I showed you how to make a tabernacle. I gave you a pattern and I showed you how to make a temple. I gave you a pattern, told David he couldn't make the temple, but his son Solomon could. Now here we are all the way in the New Testament. And now Jesus got to talk to Peter on his way to Jerusalem to get crucified. And he had to say, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. But before he said that, he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you. My father in heaven revealed this to you. And I say also, thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Saints, he already built a tabernacle, but we didn't want to dwell there. 
He already built a temple, but we didn't want to dwell there. He already made us a living temple, but sometimes we don't want to live in ourselves. So then he made a dwelling place called a sanctuary to where when you can't stand living with yourself, missed out on the temple and the tabernacle, you can still come into the church and where I am, you may be awesome. Right. And guess where that is? In the sanctuary where I lift up the glory where he is. In the sanctuary. Huh? In the sanctuary. And I said, the mercy seat. Because the mercy seat, the important part of the mercy seat is the reason we don't have to worry about if we're covered by the blood. It's because the blood of Jesus is on the mercy seat. So what we need to do is keep asking for mercy because that's the only place that the blood is necessary. Uh, we know that the blood ain't necessary for grace, but if it ever leads to mercy seat. If the blood of Jesus ever lead to mercy seat, we all going to hell to be with somebody that wasn't ever created for us by us. Mm -hmm. Satan ain't no food, boo. Mm. Oh, God, thank you. My Lord. Thank you. Lord. Thank you. And then he said, okay, your name is Peter. I know flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but it's also old news. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we can't get high-minded about Peter got some information, but it was still old news because this, Moses had done this. Joseph had done this. But okay, Peter, I'm going to talk to you like it's good news so you can get excited. You, Peter, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, in other words, it's to your advantage to not bring Satan into the dwelling place. Right. Because even if you bring him in the dwelling place, the gates of hell still ain't going to prevail against the dwelling place. Right. Amen. So how about just don't bring him? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. After you do, yeah. the gates of hell still ain't going to prevail. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank and then he says, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever is in heaven in my dwelling place, if you bind it in heaven, I'm going to also bind it in the dwelling place that you've made for me here. And if you loose it in heaven, I'm going to loose it in the dwelling place on earth that you have here. Because my whole point of existence of you being my masterpiece is I'm always trying to be with you in the same manner as when I created you. So I do a whole lot of ins and outs to create a garden of Eden for your life 24-7, 365, 86,400 seconds a day. I'm trying to find places that you can be with me. Just like when I came to look for you in the garden. So Christ is establishing the significance of the pattern of the tabernacle in this new covenant era. And Peter... You get to be the first stone that I'm going to set in place. This is real important because I'm going to, I know I'm going to debunk some things and hopefully underline others in this space that we tend to stay away from because of theological debate. But what God wants to do when he said to Peter, Peter, I'm the chief cornerstone. Mm -hmm. Don't nothing stand if I move because everything has to be built around the chief cornerstone. Yeah. That's right. But what I will tell you is that since I'm the chief cornerstone, you don't deserve it, and yet you blessed. You get ready to be the second in line. Uh -huh. <laughs> you denier, you liar. Yeah. But you're going to be second in line. So whatever got you thinking that God can put you at the back of the line because of what you did, just remember, Peter. And he allowed Peter to be the second rock. He said, it's going to be me. And then it's going to be you. You're going to be that first stone that I put in place other than me. Because God wants a revival 
different than the kind we're used to creating because his revival is built on the pattern of the revival he gave us. And he said, Peter, the chief cornerstone, but I'm still trying to get y'all back to me. So I'm going to let you be next because I need an apostolic experience that can get people back to me. All right. All right. So we don't want to deal with leadership, but this is a leadership uh, message as I continue. Jesus throughout scripture is a solid rock. The stone the builders rejected, chief cornerstone. All other stones are built around the, I'm giving you another word to write now, alignment. Okay. When Jesus spoke to Peter, he spoke to him in divine alignment. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm the chief cornerstone. But where I place you, Peter, is critical because the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of the temple and the pattern of the church all have to align with each other because it's a dwelling place. And all of it's my house. I'm not building a shopping mall. I'm not building a grocery store. I'm building a dwelling place because I can get your food and I can get your water and I can clean your car. But what I can't do is make another child that's just like you. And I want you to be a with my will, which is revealed in my house. Jesus is the word. So he's the chief cornerstone. He established the path. He created alignment. Now Jesus talks to Peter. You are now talking, Peter, to the first established chief cornerstone. And I need you to hear me, Peter. I need you to hear me, vessels of honor. I am putting you as the next piece in this critical dwelling place because I need somebody that will ensure that the foundation and the structure is aligned because I can't come into a house that's misaligned. All right. You're not just Simon, but you're now Peter. And Peter is rock. That's the interpretation of Peter. Mm -hmm. So the second established stone put in place after me, Jesus said, is the foundational stone, which without there is no alignment established. When you are thinking that you never have to come to church, you never have to come to the dwelling place. You never have to assemble yourself together. You are now creating a misalignment between you and God. Well, yeah. It's a misalignment between you and vessels of honor. It's a misalignment between you and spirit of life. It's a misalignment between you and cornerstone. It's a misalignment between you and world mission. It's a misalignment. Between you and the church of Jesus Christ. From church to church to church. And it's not going to matter because your misalignment is going to get greater. Peter, you're second because I need an apostolic leader that can keep folks in alignment. I need a leader that can go from church to church to church to make sure the church is our dwelling place. So it is an important role. It's a critical role. And that's not where it ends. I'm, ends. I'm going to jump into some five fold ministry, but I want to say a couple other things here. So upon this rock, remember the gates of hell Today, I want you to allow synonyms to be, when you hear me say the word gate or door, those are synonyms today. So the doors of hell cannot overcome the doors of the church yeah. ever. Amen. Ever. The doors of hell cannot overcome the doors of the church ever, ever, ever. 
Why is it important for you to start getting comfortable to get in this dwelling place? Because hell is laying outside that door. And if hell can keep you out of church, then hell can fool around and overtake you. But let me tell you what it has not done. It has not overcome the gate of the church. But if you go outside of the door of the church, it's the year of the door, somebody with me, remember? In this year of the door, we got to make sure that we're not just choosing things. And then when the hot comes, something wrong when we come back up into the dwelling place. All right. Because when you come to the dwelling place, guess what ain't going to be there? Fornication. Mm -hmm. All right. When you go, you, you decide to come on back in here, guess what ain't going to be in here? The evening. Yeah. Guess what ain't going to be? Because the door of the hell ain't going to prevail against you. So you ain't going to come up in here right. and get all kinds of craziness. Well, Dr. Bowers, how come all the churches is crazy? Because they decided to go against the matter. <laughs> God, I just had to walk and laugh on that because let me tell you something. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of churches called the denomination that you want to think of the biggest one and think of the smallest one. And when you ask me the question, Dr. Bauer, you done just said a strange thing. Because I see the churches and see people get delivered. And the works of the flesh are on the front row. And the chief works of the flesh is behind the pulpit. So I ain't understand you, Dr. Bauer, because I get my dance on when I go. I got some grab my tambourine. I can keep up with the pattern. It's misaligned. I ain't falling out of nobody's church. But this is what I was telling you. That the gates of hell right now do not prevail against the gates of the church. Amen. And every opportunity you have, you need to get into the dwelling place of the church because the doors of hell are trying to get you to believe that they run the church. Uh -huh. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know I'm a music person. Some of us like music so much that we'll go to the gates of hell sanctuary. <laughs> some of us so loyal to some people in our lives that we're willing to go to the gates of hell revived mm -hmm. because we believe that since our seed is the Holy Ghost that we can go into a dwelling place that's misaligned and still call it a tabernacle, a temple, a dwelling place, and a church. Satan is a liar and so are you if you believe it. Yeah. All right. Did I say something? Did y'all catch that? Yeah. Okay. I, because I'm, I'm giving you some stuff you got. So now, yeah. let me tell you what Jesus was really doing. Because this part, you know, y'all seeing me way to the crown with queens. I am Dr. Brenda. I'm your queen here. We're getting the queens and the kings and the princes and the princesses and the judges and the leaders. We're getting y'all together. But we're also calling on oxen. And calling on oxen is a platform that's going to be for the fivefold ministry. Because that's something else that God placed in me to do. But what I didn't know until yesterday when I decided to skip Bible study and study the Bible. Because there's a bunch of Bible studies on YouTube. I started studying the Bible. And then I found out that Jesus was putting the five-fold ministry into place when he said, Peter, upon this rock. Mm -hmm. Christ steps into place. The first two of the five-fold ministry were established on foundational excellence. And when you lose the job on your prophet, then your ministry is misaligned. I wish I had a friend that trusted me enough to say, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. I know that was a tough one. But let me tell you something. You kick out these apostles and prophets if you want to. They are critical pieces to the dwelling place and you'd be able to stay up in your dwelling place if you would get a word of knowledge from your prophet and a word of wisdom from your prophetess and if you got some planting by your apostle. So when Jesus told Peter, you next in line, I need to put the apostle next. Why? Because I'm not going to make one tabernacle anymore. I'm not going to make 
one temple anymore. So Peter, I need to put you over this in an apostolic way because I need you to replicate right. my voice right. because that's how bad I want to be with my people. I'm, I'm, I'm. So it's a much bigger thing than just Peter was an apostle. I'm going to give you a scripture about David. So I tell you about these doors. The apostles and the prophets are the two governing foundational bodies that keep the dwelling place in alignment. Okay. If you've never heard it said before, if you believe I'm a credible studier of the Bible, then I'm telling you that you can trust me and say amen. Yeah. Because, let me say it again, the church is built on the apostles and the prophets. Mm -hmm. They are the two governing bodies mm -hmm. that keep foundational alignment in the dwelling place. Yeah, right. Because evangelists can get them there. Right. That's right. right. Shepherds can keep them there. Yeah, there is. And teachers can build them up right. so they can become whatever they're supposed to become. That's right. <laughs> There is a five-fold ministry that is still active. So Y'all stop giving your sieves up. Stop giving your sieves up to these folks arguing about you with, the, with what Jesus said. Jesus said, Peter, I'm putting you up here, and you the apostle. And guess what, Peter? You ain't going to have the biggest church in the world. Amen. You know what you will do with your little happy self that did not be that love and the only reason you alive is because I prayed for you and I didn't pray for everybody, but because I prayed for you. Let me tell you your little happy sign. You ain't ever going to get to see no big cathedral or church because you are next in place to make sure the pastor doesn't get messed up. Right. You go to every church and make sure when they're using something other than I said, you, you straighten them out. Because wherever you go, Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You can go into any church that's being shifted, Peter, and you can use your theater and you can sift out the wrong stuff because I have a little to do. As a governing body to ensure that the alignment stays in place. Saints, we are misaligned by denomination and by theology and by gender. We are so misaligned. Somebody ain't gonna watch this because I got on pants. We are so misaligned because you might see a little rouge on somebody's face or you might see Elder James come up here and preach in a shirt and a jacket. Or some casual pants. Or Apostle Bottle put his robe on. If you look at his attire and say, nah, it's not how I want to be. You might see a whole bunch of stuff, but don't let this stuff be distractions from the alignment of the dwelling. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's why we're here. There is an extent that diversity is required, but I just want to tell you the truth. God didn't require it. All of his churches are supposed to look the same. They're supposed to have the same instruments. They're supposed to be in alignment with the pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you don't dwell long enough, you'll come here for the seats, you'll go there for the keyboard, you'll go over there for the drums, you'll go over there for the plate, and the next thing you know, you all you just like this, you ain't got nothing to say. You're unstable in all your ways. There's an anointing on the prophets. For seeing so they can work with the apostles. Mm -hmm. I'll use Apostle Bowers in a minute. Apostle Bowers is a planter. I'm a seer. I really like planting better because once I see, I can't unsee. Exactly. I got so much stuff I wish I didn't see. <laughs> I try to erase it. If you're a seer, it's just like a terrible thing because you see something and then you just say, Where is my eraser? 
I don't want to know God. Please don't tell me Jesus. I don't want that. No, no, no. But he's saying, but prophet, prophetess, you got to know. Because the apostle is planting churches based on what you see. We had various components over time that are different than the establishment of the fivefold ministry. Mm -hmm. My Lord. But in this year, look around. Ain't nobody yet had as many funerals as they got scheduled for Carlton Pearson. Right. They got about 23 different funerals That's scheduled right. all around the world for him. That's right. And the dwelling places don't look the same. Right. But there are people who are saying, but he was my apostle. He was my seer. He came over here. He planted. And I was here. And then you got the, yeah, but he went off the grid. But you got some people that say, but the, but the dwelling place I'm in is still in alignment. Because the point wasn't to follow Peter. The point was for Peter to follow Jesus. So you want to come back 20 years later and Peter the messed up. Go back to the pastor. Stop acting like you confused. Go back to the past. Yeah. <laughs> Come back in a line. Yeah. If y'all that's been here long enough, we had you in Bible study teams and you built a tabernacle. We gave you six months to build one and your team had to describe it. Oh, are we willing to build one today? My Lord. So, uh, are you really telling the truth, doctor? Let's look at Ephesians 2. Go to Ephesians 2. Whole bunch of good stuff running out of time. So let us see. Just to validate what I said. Let me go 17. And came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were not. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So we see Paul here writing this epistle talking about Jesus. Now look at verse 19. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. Well, if you're no longer a stranger or a foreigner, by now in my message, you should be able to tell me why. You're not a stranger or, or a foreigner because evidently you've been doing what? Dwelling. And not just visiting. Not just dropping off the Oh, Well, Dwelling. So, you ain't no stranger, no foreigner. Get up in here. You at home. You fellow citizens with the saints. You part of the household of God. You in alignment. You follow the path. You're the tabnet. You got Jesus on the front and Jesus on the back. And then he said in verse 20, and you're built on the foundation. Hallelujah. He got who many of y'all? Can somebody tell me what that said? Paul and you church are built upon the foundation the pattern of the apostles Peter and the prophets because Jesus Christ himself what does it say is the chief cornerstone so even right now church there's a dwelling pattern where you're sitting right now on Zoom or if you're in this room. There is a pattern and the alignment of the pattern is contingent upon those who are accepting and being active in their role in the fivefold ministry or following those who are. Mm -hmm. Yes, what a mighty God. Yes, and whom all the building fitly framed together. You know, we get to that part, but we done forgot. Yeah, that took that took the cornerstone, the apostle, and the prophet mm -hmm. for us to shout on verse 21. Mm -hmm. In whom all the building fitly framed together, growing under a holy temple in the Lord. 
But God's holy temple is fitly framed together if we yeah. honor the foundation, the pattern, and the stones that have been put in place. Okay. Yeah. If we were sifting while we were shifting, we are shifting. So the prophets and the, and the apostles and the prophets are responsible for keeping the dwelling place in alignment. That's why Apostle Bowers and I need our evangelists and our pastors and our teachers so that we can focus on keeping the dwelling place in alignment while those in the dwelling place are being ministered to. Who are you? Where are you? <laughs> and then the funniest thing, verse 20 is just that he said, don't tell nobody. That's the most interesting thing. And the next thing that happens is Jesus says, don't tell nobody. So it's a building. Means to build. By now, I'll, I'll do that next time. Because what I want to show you, I, I must do this before I sit down. One, the church can't get back into a life. So this is a really good message. Yeah. The message has a happy ending. Does anybody believe we can put the church back in alignment? After hearing today's message, do you believe that you're equipped to put the church back into alignment? Have you committed to make sure that God's dwelling place has somebody dwelling in it with him? Yes. Because if that's the case, then I ain't got to sit around no sign-up sheet. <laughs> How can we dwell in a place of habitation versus coming to a place to visit and leave as soon as possible? How can we get confronted by the Holy Ghost if we're not in his presence? Okay, I'll say something about that. The reason I put that in there was we say we want the Holy Ghost to do something for us, but we ain't in his presence. So we want the Holy Ghost to do stuff, but we don't want to come dwell in the house of the Lord. We want the Holy Ghost to do it in the car. We want to do it in the grocery store. We want to do it in the laundromat. We want to do it in the bathroom. How come you won't come get into the dwelling place where the pattern it is, is in alignment and you've got the five-fold ministry working on your behalf? If you get up in here, the Holy Ghost won't confront you. The Holy Ghost won't say, oh, you really want to talk about that? But where you been last seven Sunday? Oh, you want to talk about him? All right, but what would you do? But if we don't want to get confronted by the Holy Ghost, if we don't want the Holy Ghost to say to us, I'm just listening to you to talk, talking about all your stuff. You up in here with me. This is my dwelling place. Right. Get on your knees. Fall on your face. Let me sanctify you. Stop purging yourself and forgiving yourself. We don't want to get confronted like that by the Holy Ghost right now. But we ought to. Yeah. We ought, we ought to be in a position to where we want to get to the dwelling place so the Holy Ghost can't confront us. Yes. Right. But then we can't call nobody up and tell us who cussed us out. Oh, no. <laughs> then we can't say who was down at the church and messed up our prayer. Yes. But I promise you, if you come to the dwelling place that's aligned, just as the tabernacle and temple was, the Holy Ghost will confront you. And it's a great thing when yeah, he does. Sure. So there's, I got it. Let, let me, there's some other fivefold ministry things that I'll go into. One of which is even just the curtains of the tabernacle. There were five of them. And those five curtains were coupled together at, in the fivefold ministry. I have depictions of that. What is interesting for you math medical folks that would made it about a 28 by four cubic in these uh curtains 42 feet by six feet five on one side five on the other 1620 square cubits for the size about 112 feet a hundred is the per is the number of perfect sanctification and 12 is the number of divine perfected order so the curtains that are in place for the five from ministry so it's just somebody saying i'm part of the blueprint I just yell out, I'm part of the blueprint. I need you to know you're part of the blueprint because there's a perfect governmental order, but it has an exact alignment. And what we're contending with is the pushback on the alignment versus the order. We are more misaligned than we are neglecting the elements that should be placed. So to recreate God's blueprint and divine plan to accommodate our desires and order, 
then we got to get in divine order. We have to ignite the fivefold ministry. We got to get the structure in place. And if our piece of the curtain is creating its own empire, then that curtain is out of alignment. You never have to be afraid of the fivefold ministry unless the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher are getting a curtain out of alignment. Right. And there ought to be enough other folks that's getting them back in line. So those that are in the pews, in the dwelling place, now I'm throwing to leaders. Leaders, those that are coming that aren't looking for a title, should not have to deal with our messy leadership misalignment. All right. All right, I'm just calling my ox. We got to eliminate the competition and the discourse. It ain't working, y'all. It messed us up. So let me just tell you about the four doors because I got to go through all of this because I really, year 5784. And one of the key things is it's the year of David as well. And I have a picture of this for you also. What I want this shift, so I'm going to move. A door is a dalet. Say dalet. D A L E T. Dalet. In the Hebrew, that means door. And we're in year. 5784, we're in the year of the Dalit because that's the last number. But the second to the last number, eight, is pay. And the letter pay in Hebrew means mouth. Year of David. Oh, this is a phenomenal thing. It may just want to jump this out. And you know, I hope it gives you as, as, as much as it did. So it's David. So we're in the year of the door, the Dalit, the year of the mouth, pay. David knew that the only way to win the war was to use his mouth for praise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. He had to use the pay so that every time he praised, he was warring. David knew that ever praise that ever praise was a war. He knew that ever praise was a book. He knew that ever praise was an error. So it, we're in the decade of pay. This is the fourth year of the decade of pay. We are in the decade of the month, and your mouth is speaking life, and your mouth is speaking death. But if you use your mouth for praise, then you're using it as war. And you're tearing Satan's kingdom down. The enemy. And all the young enemies and friend of me. They want you to not use your pay. They want to keep your mouth shut. They're telling you secrets and saying, don't say it again. And now you're in the year of the door and you're trying to figure out if you're supposed to go through it or not. But you can't open your mouth. But if you do, it will be a praise of war because you're putting on the spirit of death. And if you war through praise, if the door should open, it will. And if it should stay shut, it will be cemented and nobody can know. When all you got to do is use your pay. The dollar is in the fourth commandment. He knocks upon this door, but we have to be willing to enter into its rest. I want to end by just telling you the four doors because we're going to be talking about the four doors. And right before doing that and then I'm done, is I want you to know the first place the door is mentioned in the Bible. So the law first mentions, and then the last place. The first place that the word door is mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 4, verses 6 through 8. And the Lord said to Cain, so think of context. This is the first place the word door is mentioned in the Bible. He said to Cain, why are you wroth? And why is your kindness falling? Who you mad at, Cain? If you did well, I'm going to accept your offering, right? But if you didn't do well, 
What are those next five words? If you, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. That's the first place door is mentioned in the Bible. Is God showing grace, asking Cain what kind of offering he had? And then he even gave Cain the consequences. He said, Cain, if you're lying and you ain't giving me a good offering, let me tell you, it ain't going to serve you well. Because let me tell you what's at the door. It doesn't say Satan's at the door. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep, I got to get that out of it. Go take, get it out of it. It does not say that Satan is at the door. It says sin is at the door. It's not the wages of Satan is death. The wages of sin is death. Stop giving Satan credit for your sin because you're going to fool around in hell calling your sin Satan. And your sin is just your sin. And if you sin, then what lies at the door is That's the first place the door is. This is interesting. And the last place is in Revelation, the fourth chapter. And just trying to just get fourth verse. Last place the word doors in the Bible. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet. And what was the trumpet doing? talking with me. Hmm. What did I just tell you pay does? Hmm. Pay is your day to pay is your mouth. Mm -hmm. And your mouth, every time you speak, it is not only sound, it is weaponry. Mm -hmm. Your praise is weaponry. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus said, after I looked and behold, the door was open in heaven. And I heard a voice from the door and it was a trumpet and the trumpet was talking to me. And the trumpet said, come in. You know how I was in a line. Mm -hmm. So he could come in. Four doors in heaven, I'm taking my seat because we're gonna talk about them next time I get up. I hope you've been blessed. Y'all still with me? Amen. You know, my goal is to do what the Holy Ghost said. So we're moving from Gamel to the dollar to four. So uh, <clears throat> it's very fascinating as I give you these last points that there are four primary biblical doors. So we're in that year, 57, 84. We're in the year of pay and the dollar. So we're in this year of four, but there actually are four primary biblical doors in the Bible. I'm going to give them to you and then we'll talk about them in the future. Doors, gates. So these are access points into, and there are also enclosures out of. Okay. So it's just the year of the door. And we need to close the doors in our lives. Okay. God can close them and we keep opening them. Yeah. He's dead voted them and we've life voted. Them. Right. He said they're impermeable and we just let them in and out. This is a year where you have to be courageous enough to shut doors. You have to be courageous enough to say, yep, I've had it open for 50 years, but today it's closed. And it's, and it's dead bolted. It ain't opening no more. And you know why? Because if we do these four doors, vessels of honor, then the world will have a place to look at, to know what the pattern in alignment should be. Okay. Door number one, gates of the city. These are the gates of government. These doors are being opened and closed in the space of government and politics. Doesn't matter if it's Trump or Biden, or Biden, doesn't matter if it's Cyrus or Nebuchadnezzar. There is a door that is a gate to the city and the gate to the city is a gate of government. Mm -hmm. So people are given and honor keys to the city. That may be a way for you to remember it. But God 
is bringing forth disruptors to disrupt the disruptors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're in a political time where God is using disruptors to disrupt the disruptors. So if you are part of the door of the government, then you may be feeling this constant disruption. How, how am I going to be one to bring bad news? Because that's your job. Because there needs to be a disruption in order to get in alignment. Now, I can say this because it's Apostle Bowers. Oh, my. Let us have a better appreciation of what it must be to have to manage the door of the city mm -hmm. and to also be an apostle that's watching the line. Okay. I'm helping you to help us pray for us. Second door. Doors to the sanctuary. The doors to the sanctuary are heavenly doors. The doors to the sanctuary reveal divine things. In this year that we're in, we, we will and we are seeing an increase of a hunger and thirst for godliness. That's going to increase. Some of that hunger and thirst is happening because people are um, following people who have died. But let us not underestimate the on the way to one of those home going coming services that somebody just might experience the door of a sanctuary and experience something heavenly because they fool around and step in a place of alignment. So we cannot underestimate the power of the fallout of people leaving here. All right. Because people need direction to the blueprint. We can't just keep having conversations about what we think was and wait to see what's going to happen. There are souls that need alignment to the blueprint. Right. Doors of the sanctuary. So this is where we abide in God and his presence abides in the sanctuary. And this is the shift from opening churches to planting habitations. Okay. That's something else for you to write down. Even for vessels of honor. In this year, we have to shift but from being focused on opening churches or even this church and shift to planting habitations. Yes, glory to God. We need to have places where people come and live with God. Yes. Not just high numbers and a quick service that follows the routine. Right. From the opening to the benediction. Uh, can we create, using the blueprint, can we plant a habitation instead of just say we need another church? Because there's plenty of churches closing. Yeah. Doors to the sanctuary. Antioch. When we look at Antioch in the book of Acts, Antioch is a great example because Antioch was a place that sent and received. It was a sending and receiving center. So Antioch actually made five full ministry people. And they, they came in, they taught them, they pushed them out so they could make more churches. It actually was a center of sending and receiving. And people just thought it wasn't a big church because it, folks weren't there all that long. They were only there for a period of time. That was because that was the purpose of their church. The third door, a very important one, is the door to the private dwelling place. Apostle Bauer said this years ago. I want to reiterate it. The do this is the door of the family. And this is a year, I think I heard Elder Wheatley say it, a year of reconciliation. Doors of families are being opened, but you got to be willing to let the prodigal come home. All right. Yes. yes. Thanks the Lord. Yes. Doors to the private dwelling place is the third door. Gamal, represented as Gideon, he walked around, but he had to get in alignment. So we have to get in alignment and embrace this door of our private dwelling. 
When's the last time you've anointed every door in your house? Do you still know where your sanctuary is? If you have one, has the Bible been opened in the sanctuary that we asked you to put together? Because right now, this day, go and make your house a godly habitation because it's one of the four doors. Mm -hmm. Clear out your house and make room for me, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. We are types and shadows of the ark of the tabernacle, of the temple, of the habitation, of the dwelling place. Anoint and pray over every doorpost in your house. Mm -hmm. Everyone that enters and passes by your house should feel a shifting and a sifting. All right, let's try that. Last door. Door to the temple treasury. <laughs> I said, where would the money at? The money is the fourth door. The fourth door is the door to the temple treasury. It's the door of the finances. And you can see this in 2 Kings 12 and 9. But again, Gamel, which is, expresses Gideon, the richest one, the rich man, let me tell you what's going on right now. The rich man is walking toward the dollar, the door. The rich man is walking toward the dollar, the door. I need you to get with me because we got the dollar. We're in the year of the door. And there are rich men looking for dollars. They're walking around looking for dollars to deal out blessings to the poor and the bent over and the empowered. The dollars. Saints, if we stay humble, God will come and deal out blessings. Mm -hmm. The top of the dollar is said to be an ear. So we need to hear what the spirit is saying to us. Obedience will unlock the doors to the temple treasury. We do not have to be poor, saints. Right. If we obey the pattern, yeah. the door of the treasury will open for us. It's a biblical door. It will give you pressed down, shaken together, running over without measure. It will be given there. It's a door that's called the door of the temple treasury. Yeah. Yeah. God has a bank. All right. What do your account look like? Yeah. Well, transfer is still in play today. Okay. Right now, yeah. we need to open our eyes so we can get some wealth transfer. It's time to humble ourselves, yeah. to be obedient, to sanctify ourselves, and to seek God first in everything. Because if we seek God first in everything, we don't have to worry about anything yeah. Yeah. except love. Are you sifting in your shifting? And are you ready to get familiar with being aligned with the pattern to allow the fivefold ministry to be activated biblically and then to not just come to Bible study, but study the Bible on the gates of the city, which are the gates of the government, the doors to the sanctuary, which are the doors to the heavenly things. The third door is the door of the private dwelling. You got to manage that. And the fourth door is the door of the temple treasury. We need all of them active because we ain't talking about Satan no more. He ain't in the meeting and he ain't in the conversation. And it wasn't him that laid at the door. It was sin. Right. So let's forget about him. And how about we put our sin and our shortcoming on the altar and help recreate this place as a dwelling place instead of just a place that we visit. It behooves me to not be just stopping right on time with what God is saying. But I tell you what, every evil spirit that thought it was going to shut down this work and just run however far it's going to go because it's not only going to be preached by me. Hopefully you'll turn on somebody and hear the same thing being preached because there is a word from the Lord. Because there is one Lord. And he's not a Baptist Lord and a Lutheran Lord and a Kojic Lord and an Apostolic Lord. He's just one Lord. 
All right. And he had. Hey.